Greetings, gentle viewers. I'm George from Ireland. Here I am in Greyfriars Churchyard in Edinburgh, hard by Greyfriars Church. It's so called because back in the Catholic era in Scotland, there was an order of monks here. They're known as the Grey Friars because of the grey habits they wore, as in grey clothes. So friar can be another word for monk. A monk is addressed as brother. Um, so the French word for brother is frère, and that was corrupted into friar in English. Anyway, the Reformation came, that was the end of the monks, and this abbey was turned into a church. So uh, this uh, graveyard is one of the most distinguished graveyards in uh, North Britain, and the great and the good of this city would like to be interred here, including the Adam family, uh, a very notable architect, and many of his relatives lay to rest there. Now, you may notice uh, that there's this um, uh, black wrought iron gate at the front, and the same with a few of the other mausolea. You might be wondering why. And there are more examples of this around uh, the graveyard, sometimes mort safes, a cage built around the grave. Well, it takes us back to the time of the Resurrectionists in the late uh, 18th century and into the early 19th century. So Edinburgh University, founded in 1784, is very close to this graveyard and uh, was one of the most uh, renowned universities uh, in Europe. So it had a superb medical school. Now, uh, medical students, they need uh, cadavers to dissect in order to understand anatomy. So they need a fresh supply of, um, of dead bodies. So they wanted them to have died just hours ago, ideally, so they'd be in good condition, well preserved, so they could really see what's going on. So it'd be, it'd be perfect if, if uh, the body could be um, the picture of health, all apart from the small fact of being dead. So uh, bodies were delivered there if they died consequent upon judicial hanging, occasionally suicides, um, foundlings, as in babies who were abandoned um, um, and just found and died because they had no parents to claim them, people like that. But uh, there wasn't a sufficient supply as the medical school expanded and there were more undergraduates wishing to, uh, to study uh, medicine. Um, so resurrectionists were people who would go and resurrect the body, dig up a dead body, ideally the very, the very night it had been buried, buried in the daytime, dug up a few hours later, and then taken to the medical school to be dissected. So the odd thing is there was actually no crime of stealing a dead body since it wasn't property. Disturbing a grave was a crime, though the penalties weren't that severe. So people uh, did not want their dear departed uh, relatives to end up um, on the dissecting table um, in the, the theater. They do call it a theater where these dissections took place. So they would build more safes. They built something like this, um, uh, this um, metal cage, so you couldn't get in there to dig it up. They wouldn't necessarily stay there forever. They'd sometimes just stay on for a few months, by which time the body would have decomposed to such an extent that it would be valueless, that nobody would want to dissect it, but it would largely have corrupted. And then more examples over here. So what, what to do? And brings me on to the case of Burke and Hare, two of the most notorious uh, murderers in Scotland's history. So William Burke and William Hare both came from Ireland. Um, William um, Burke uh, was born in County Tyrone. He'd served in the British Army. Um, it was completely uncontroversial to join the British Army in Ireland in those days. Um, William Hare was born um, considerably later, we're not quite sure when, with probably from Armagh. Anyway, they both were here in, in, in Edinburgh, which had a considerable Irish community at the time. There was a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice, although William, William Burke, they brought up a Catholic, he attended Presbyterian prayer meetings. Um, so he was, he was um, a cobbler by trade and doing reasonably well. Uh, he was married, he had several children. But then things started to go bad, wrong for him. He developed a bit of a drinking problem. So uh, he had someone who was uh, subletting a room in his house to a tenant who died, owing a lot of back rent. What was he gonna do? Well, um, Burke decided he would sell the corpse to uh, a Dr. Knox, who was a lecturer at Edinburgh University in medicine. And Knox didn't get a salary. He charged the students to attend his, um, his dissections. Um, and so the, the, the price for a dead body was something like eight pounds, and eight pounds was a very tidy sum of money. You could buy a good horse for that amount of money, okay? Um, so it was, it was uh, more money than some people earned in a year. Um, so as you can imagine, um, uh, Burke was delighted with this. Uh, and so um, they, he and William Hare, they began a grave robbing, not for jewelry or anything, any body and selling it to him. There was a particular premium for female bodies because the medical students were all male, only men were permitted to attend uh, university in those days, and those who were executed were about 95% male. So uh, the male undergraduates, they didn't understand the female body quite so much. 
so there was the, you'd be paying more for a woman's body than for a man's. Um, but there was this panic about grave robbing, and so the mort safes were built, so Birkenhead began to seek the dead amongst the living. It was a rich irony that someone who was absolutely penniless suddenly became very valuable the moment she died. Uh, they would be trans transformed into something valuable. Anyway, so Birkenhead, they began to prey on people on the margins of society. Um, find a uh, pauper who wouldn't be missed by society, invite him or her to the house for a, drum, for, for a dram of whiskey and a hammer blow to the head. And then having finished the person off, they would drag the person around to Dr. Knox in a trunk. Burke and Hare, they had their cover story. They would say, we got up early in the morning and we found this person on the street, presumably must have got drunk at night and fallen out of a high window and died. Uh, not an uncommon occurrence at the time. It was a rather high rise city. Alcoholism was widespread, I'm sorry to say. Um, and uh, if you were to perform an autopsy on the body, you would determine the person had died from blunt trauma to the head. That would be consistent with falling out of a window, but really it was really uh, be being hit on the head with a, with a hammer or a bottle. Um, so that's that. So William, uh, Bur William Burke and William Hare continued their depredations for some time, also stealing the clothes of their victims, giving the clothes to their nieces and nephews. Um, and it was just going fine for Knox, who was very happy with this. Um, uh, anyway, it all went wrong for them um, in 1829, um, if memory serves. And um, one of the undergraduates in the lecture said, wait, I know her. I saw her just three days ago and she was in rude health. How come she suddenly died? One of the undergraduates recognized the corpse. Stop, stop, stop. Questions would be asked. The other corpses had been disposed of. Within hours, they'd been cut up and thrown away in bits. So an investigation was launched. Who was this woman? Who was the last person saw her? Burke and Hare were arrested. A few other suspects were arrested. Was Knox in on the plot? Now, um, Knox didn't exactly know that Burke and Hare had murdered these people. He just must have had a fairly good idea. Wasn't it suspicious that they kept turning up with dead bodies on regular intervals with no explanation as to who the person was and he chose not to ask any questions? Um, so what, uh, what happened next? So they were, they, they were questioned, held separately, and eventually, um, the Lord Advocate, as in sort of senior, senior judge, Scotland, the government's lawyer, William Ray, persuaded Hare to turn King's evidence. William IV was on the throne at the time, and he was going to um, implicate uh, his co-conspirator, um, uh, William Burke, saying that, um, you know, it was all uh, his idea. He's the intellectual author of the crime, but yes, I went along with it. So um, uh, Hare was given immunity from prosecution in return for being the um, Crown's star witness. Um, uh, and, and that was that. So um, they, got, they got this confession out of him and they got chapter and verse on exactly how the murders had been carried out. 16 murders in all, um, mostly of, of, of women, a few men, mostly Scots, a few English and at least one Irish person. So uh, that was that. Um, uh, Burke was found guilty. The sentence of death was pronounced upon him with a black cap upon the judge's head. I don't remember who the beak on the bench was, but it was, it was an absolute sensation. It, it convulsed the British Isles, this. Um, so it was reported and thousands of people wanted to view the trial. There had to be soldiers on hand to keep them back. People thought that the, the, the mob might riot and try and lynch him there and then. So he was sentenced to death. As I say, there was considerable anti-Catholic bigotry uh, in Great Britain at the time. This was used against the Catholic minority. Moreover, the hot um, political issue of the day was Catholic emancipation. Should Roman Catholics, should we have the same rights as everybody else, such as the right to be elected to Parliament, to be army officers and so forth? And people saying, oh, we can't have that. Look at Burke and Hare. Two people out of millions of Catholics did something bad, so they're all guilty. If a Protestant does it, of course, that doesn't make all Protestants guilty. Anyway, so it's early in the next year, um, uh, right there in front of uh, in the grass market, um, uh, uh, William Burke was hanged by the by this slow drop as they left to dangle, taking him about 20 minutes to die before a huge baying mob. And quite appositely, his body was then dissected in the medical school. So um, William Hare had to be escorted out by soldiers for his own safety, otherwise been torn to bits by the enraged crowd. Um, and uh, he eventually made it back to back to Ireland. Um, we're not quite sure what happened to the rest of his life. And William Burke's wife was also drummed out of town. But uh, the thing is, some people said that was too much. You actually let William Hare off scot-free. He murdered 16 people. He's not going to serve one day in prison. You didn't need to offer immunity from prosecution. You could have offered him an exemption from the death penalty, life imprisonment. He would have accepted that, penal servitude. 
but um, they said, no, we have given the king's word that uh, he will get immunity from prosecution, so he will be let off with no punishment whatsoever. Maybe they shouldn't have made that promise, but they had made that promise, and they were going to honour it, um, because people would know in future that if you do turn king's evidence, that the crown will fulfil its promises. So that, those are the notorious Burke and Hare's murders. There's some dog rule, which I can't quite remember, saying um, uh, up the close and doom the stair. Um, uh, Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, Knox is the boy who buys the beef. Beef, of course, meaning human bodies in this case, not bovine meat. So that's the, 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 um, the Burke and Hare murders. And there are other places here in Greyfriars Churchyard where you can see some mort safes, though fortunately they haven't been needed for quite some time.